Welcome to Beyond the Scenes, the podcast that goes deeper into topics that you've seen on The Daily Show. Let me explain this podcast for you. I know the regulars, y'all know you're tired of me doing this, but we always got new listeners. Let me let me break down this podcast for you. All right, all right. The Daily Show is French fries. Them the beautiful fries that you get when you order French fries. This podcast is the chili cheese that makes it a chili cheese fry. We modify it. We put gravy on it. We call it poutine. We put a little sprinkles of onions on it. And then that little grease that's in the bottom of the chili cheese. And you... <laughs> oh, y'all don't be drinking the grease in the bottom of the chili Anyway, I'm Roy Wood Jr. Today, we are talking about the right to repair and why products are designed to be unfixable by the average person. Give me the clip. We live in a free market, but when it comes to repairing electronics like smartphones, you are not free to choose where to go. If you were the hopeless person with a broken gadget, you'd immediately go to the Apple store. And that's exactly what Apple wants you to do. The company and many others restricts how and where you can repair your stuff. Anything that has a chip in it right now is probably impossible to repair without using the manufacturer. That means tractors and cars. It means your smartphone. It means increasingly the refrigerators and washing machines that people have in their homes. My first guest today is the owner of the Rossman Repair Group and a popular YouTuber who creates repair tutorial videos, Lewis Rossman. Welcome to Beyond the Scenes. How you doing today? Hey, thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. That chair is amazing. I would like to order one from you. Give me the link after the show. Will do. Okay. <laughs> Our other guest is a law professor at the University of Michigan, now author of the book, The Right to Repair, Aaron Perzanowski. Aaron, welcome to Beyond the Scenes. How you doing? I'm great. It's great to be with you today. Now, let's talk a little bit about this, because this was something that I didn't even know was a thing until I read Steve Jobs' book, and they talked about how mad computer designers were at Apple in the 80s when the first Macintoshes started rolling off the assembly line. But before we get into any of that, let's just unpack, first and foremost, what does right to repair mean? Aaron, give us the legal legal mumbo-jumbo of it real quick. To me, at the core... The right to repair really boils down to a commitment to this very basic idea that when we as consumers buy things, when we own things, we should have the freedom to fix those things in the way that we choose, right? Mm -hmm. We should be able to do it ourselves. We should be able to take it to the independent repair shop of our choice. And that means the manufacturer doesn't get to stand in the way of that decision on our part to do what we want with our own property. And I think it also means that the legal system shouldn't recognize artificial barriers that get in the way of people exercising that choice. Let's talk a little bit about it from your side, Lewis. Talk to me a little bit about your love of electronics and your desire to tinker and modify. Like, where does that come from as a person? Because I'm just one of them people, I buy some shit, however it come out the box, that's good enough for me. That's how my corporate overlords wanted me to enjoy the item. So where does the desire to tinker and play and move things around come from? Being honest, in my case, I don't have some origin story where I say I was taking apart my stereo when I was four years old because I love to tinker. I bought something on eBay that I needed in order to work on a recording session. The studio that I worked at went out of business. I had no money because I just lost my job, and the thing that I bought arrived broken. I got a refund for the thing that arrived broken from the eBay seller. So now I thought, hmm, I have this thing sitting here that I paid $0 for. Instead of spending that money again on something else, what if I got to pocket that money that for the thing I just got refunded on and figure out how to make this thing work? And I did. So the incentive structure for me was that if I could make this work again, I now had a nest egg of money that I could budget to do something else with. And I always kind of had the, I always kind of enjoyed, you know, just learning how these types of things work, opening things that you're not supposed to open. Maybe it's oppositional defiance disorder or something. But if it says, you know, warranty void if removed, I'm the type of person that would open it just because. So for me, it really started out with, this is a way to save a few hundred dollars during a time in my life when I didn't have a few hundred dollars. So then does that motivate your desire to be a part of the right to repair movement or is it rooted more in the legalese of just, no, I should have a right to do this even if I don't want to fix that thing and I don't know shit about that particular device. Or is it about just wanting the freedom to be able to do things, you know, culturally? 
I'd, I'd say it's both. I mean, for me, I, li I like the fact that I went from making, you know, like $400 a month, having a business with six to 12 people that I could pay way more than $400 a month. And I also like seeing other people get to start businesses. And when I get fan mail from people that say, you know, I used to work at Walmart for $10 an hour, and now I make $90,000 a year working from home. Thank you. Like that stuff motivates me. When it comes to the legal side, what motivates me there is the sheer amount of nonsense that you hear from regulators when you actually meet them in person. So my friend actually had to drag me to the New York State Legislature in May of 2015, because I was one of those people that thought, this is a waste of time. I'm not going to bother showing up here. Nobody cares. And I showed up, I got in a room with one of the legislators, and they said, well, the, the lobbyist for the other side said that when you replace a chip or a fuse on this motherboard, you're turning it from a MacBook into a PC and you're misrepresenting it as if it is still a MacBook to your customer, which is fraud. So that's why this bill is bad. And I, I you know, my, my face almost turned red. I'm just thinking that's the, that's the biggest pile of something I can't say on television I've ever heard in my life. Oh, you can uh, say it right here, you? baby. This, we on the internet, baby. I don't give a fuck. Oh, say yeah, what okay. it is. Yeah, that was just the biggest pile of bullshit I ever heard in my entire <laughs> fucking life. So I just thought, like, there's no way in, like, what caused you to believe this? Why did you believe this? And he says, well, you know, nobody's ever shown up to my office from your side until now, so I never got to hear your side of the story. But now I did. And then he start, and I was like, what are you writing? And he goes, I'm co-sponsoring your bill. Uh, so that was wow. it. Like, you know, I, I showed up, I, did, I wasn't in dress clothes or anything. I'm not a professional lobbyist. I just showed up to my assembly person's office. I told him why the you know the people from Apple and TechNet were full of shit, and he just listened to me. So I, that, I thought I'm never going to allow them to be in the room without somebody else to call them on their shit as long as I live. Like even if a bill doesn't get passed, just knowing <laughs> that they're winning on easy mode, like are you kidding me? You have legislators <laughs> thinking that when I replace a fuse that I've turned a device into something else, and now I'm committing fraud. That just that that just made me so incredibly mad that I I said I'm going to show up. I was so pissed that I also didn't have a camera rolling. So I said, every time I go to a legislative hearing throughout the country, I'm going to make sure there's a camera rolling. So if you say some stupid shit like that, I'm going to catch you and make you famous. And that's pretty much what I've been doing. Jesus Christ. You said it to all. You went from easy to all mad in, in one summer. Yo, to that point, then, Lewis, talk to me a little bit about how the community is organized to help one another. And then, Aaron, I want you to break down how legally illegal that shit is that Lewis is talking about. Uh, about uh, talk to me a little bit about the repair culture community, the fix it culture community and how people come together to help one another. Because there could be people, there are people that are dealing with the same bullshit that you deal with with devices who aren't as tech savvy. They don't own a bunch of micro screwdrivers and Allen wrenches and all of that shit. So talk to me a little bit about how people have come together and kind of coalesce to try and fight the power on this. Well, what I've tried to do with my channel is show as many people as possible how to do this stuff for free. So, you know, back 10 years ago, many people did thought that if they shared information on how to fix something, that that would mean that my competitor will be able to do the same job I do, and then I'll go out of business. And I've tried to kind of disprove that over time by saying, here's one of the most difficult repairs to do in our industry. I'm going to open source pretty much every piece of information I have on how to do this. So anybody can do it uh, that is willing to put the time and effort into watch. And as time grew, it was really cool to see other people start similar channels where they're showing people how to fix stuff. And, you know, the, everybody who is in this industry realizes how hard it is to get parts or to figure things out. So it's so all these different Facebook groups start, web forums, uh, IRC rooms, Discord rooms, where people are sharing tips and tricks on how to fix the newest devices. And I, I find that really cool. Aaron, how legal is all of that shit he just said? Can people do all of that? Like, because I hear stories of people meeting up in cafes and that, like the same way you have a speed dating event, apparently they just have events where motherfuckers just all show up with broken iPhones and they just all tinker together <laughs> with electronics and laptops. Is that like, is that great? Where does that fall in the gray area? So, you know, historically from a legal perspective, repairing the things that you own is 100% legal, right? There has historically been no question about this. And we've got cases under U.S. copyright law and U.S. patent law going back to the 1850s where the U.S. Supreme Court recognizes that repairing the things that you buy is a perfectly legal activity. What we've seen over the last few decades, though, is a real shift in the way that companies think about repair and in the way that they're trying to get the legal system to think about repair. They want to sell us things 
with strings attached, right? They want to say, yeah, 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 I'll sell you the phone, but I'm going to impose all these limitations on what you can and can't do with it. And some of those restrictions enforced through software in many cases go to the question of whether we have the ability to repair our own things. And for me, from a legal perspective, what I'm trying to do is remind courts, remind legislators that this is an aberration, right? This is a very recent shift from the way we've handled technology, not just in this country since 1850, but like literally since, you know, cavemen were making hand axes. We've always repaired the technology that we build and we do it in whatever way kind of suits the needs of the owner. And so I think that's really kind of uh, the, 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 the crucial thing to understand here is this is a, a really recent shift. What are some of the other products that kind of fall under this? Because this isn't just a solely electronic thing. Like, I'll tell you a story. I, so I have sleep apnea. I have a CPAP machine. I've had a CPAP machine for a while. When I moved from L.A., when I got The Daily Show, 2015, right? I go from New York to L.A. I, I go from L.A. to New York. And I have to go to a new doctor and the new doctor is going, oh, well, I've got to see the machine to adjust the the air pressure level. And that'll be six hundred dollar deductible, deductible, deductible. And just I was like, you know what? That don't even seem right. And I went on YouTube and under 45 seconds, I figured out how to do something that cost that would have cost me six hundred dollars. And. I don't know if that was me hacking my CPAP machine, but I do feel like you motherfuckers could have told me what buttons to press at the same time to bring up the secret menu that you didn't want me to know about so that I could modify and adjust my CPAP as needed. How dare you? What are some of the other devices that are kind of set up to be tamper proof so that the company can have the proprietary control over it? So I think that's a really great example, right? I think the the instances where this issue uh, troubles me the most are the ones in which there's a piece of equipment that a consumer is dependent on in a really important way, right? And when you're talking about medical devices, of course, right, those are really crucial to people's lives. Uh, when you're talking about agricultural equipment, right, farmers need their John Deere tractors to work and they need them to work every day, right? It's a time sensitive operation when you're engaged in farming. To a lesser extent, right, we are all dependent on our smartphones as well. And so when you have that kind of dependence where people feel like literally or figuratively they cannot live without this device, then, you know, you can really take advantage of consumers by charging these exorbitant prices for repairs. And so we see this across the economy. Okay, so we're talking medical equipment, we're talking a tractor. Oh, Lord, my my wheat harvester thing broke down and the wheat needs to be harvested this week, but a repairman can't come for three weeks and I'm going to lose my crops. Or I, w- I would imagine appliances probably fall into that same game. If I run a laundromat and I've got five dryers down and shit like that, what's to stop the farmer from doing what I did with the CPAP machine and just popping the hood open on that bitch and then going on Google, watching Lewis videos. Lewis, I assume at some point you're going to expand your YouTube account to cover tractor equipment at some point. How do companies stop people from doing the hack or doing the self-repair? What are the ways that companies block this? So there are a whole bunch of strategies. Some of the most obvious ones are just the way they design the hardware itself, right? So you take a product like Apple's AirPods that are glued together, they're soldered together, they don't have screws, they don't have removable parts or replaceable parts. That makes it really tough to repair, right? A John Deere tractor is not quite the same problem. They're a big piece of what we're talking about is how software built into these devices restricts the ability to repair them. So one of the, I think, most troubling trends that we see is this idea of part pairing, right? Which is the practice of taking software and using it to identify a specific piece of hardware, not just the screen on an iPhone, but your screen on your iPhone or the optical drive in your PlayStation and then preventing you from swapping it out with an otherwise identical part, 
right, if it needs mm -hmm. to be replaced. We see that in the agricultural space, right? John Deere essentially does this by including software on their tractors. That means if you replace a component, even if it's an authentic John Deere part, even if it's installed exactly the right way, they still have to send their technician out to your farm days later, <laughs> weeks later, to plug in the laptop and literally press a button to allow your device to work, right? They're basically holding these farmers hostage when it comes to repair. Your tractor got two-factor authentication? <laughs> Is that what you're telling me? <laughs> It, not quite that sophisticated, right? But it is a system that means if you don't have access to that software, your tractor is going to sit there, even though it's been fixed until John Deere comes out and, you know, gives their blessing and charges you uh, for the, you know, the time the technician's driving to your farm and the time they're driving back, right? It's adding a lot of expense and it's also slowing down the process, which farmers really care a lot about. Okay, so then the people that navigate around those hurdles, people like Lewis. Lewis, talk to me a little bit about the penalties. How do these companies come after you? Do they send you a cease and desist? Do they, do they leave a dead horse head in your bed, Godfather style? In 2016, I had been doing repair videos at that point for about four years, and I would show schematics on the screen that were obtained from, well, a place I can't say here. So you're not supposed to share these schematics. Nobody at the company is supposed to give them out, but somebody always winds up leaking them and giving them out. Wait, so why can't I have the the instruction repair manual for some shit I bought? That's not public? Like, if I bought tractor device or if I bought big refrigerator like I know there's basic instructions for the refrigerator but the actual how the guts of it work that's not public that's not public and if you share it you there is it could be civil or criminal liability for it so I, I had a law firm called Kilpatrick and Townsend call and say hey we love your YouTube content and I'm like no you don't and they said <laughs> oh yeah we love your YouTube content there's just this, this one you know portion of this video that we would like you to edit out and I look at the portion of the video and it's the part where I'm showing the location of a resistor that's acting as a fuse on a MacBook so if you spill water in the trackpad area there's this res zero ohm resistor that acts like a fuse that sits between the trackpad and the computer. So you spilling liquid in your trackpad doesn't kill your whole computer. It's it's a fine design. I have no problem with them having it there. But the, I, I wanted to show people the location of it so that they knew to check it because on this machine, it was dead. And they said, we want that removed. And I said, well, I don't really want to remove it unless you file a DMCA claim. And I never heard from them again. Because when you file a DMCA claim, you have to say who you are and why you want it removed. So that would have mm -hmm. essentially forced Apple to say, uh, we don't want people to know the location of a basic fuse in our machine because we're assholes. And they went away. But um, I don't know if they would have went away in the same way if I didn't have like 40,000 subscribers at the time that I did that. So that, that that's one way, you know, when, when you're showing people these things, if you're showing a schematic on screen, they there's technically, there's legal liability there and they could just have your videos removed or your channel removed from the internet. How much more profit are companies seeing? Because, you know, there has to be a motivation and a reason for this. I don't imagine it's solely because Apple doesn't want you to be creative with their items. How much of these actions by corporations do the two of them, both of you feel free to speak to this, how much of their actions do you think are profit driven? Because, you know, you take a refrigerator, like my grandma got a frigid air from, from segregation. That thing's still running down in the bed. It's noisy, but that thing's still going. Meanwhile, my mama's refrigerator died after like seven years. Are they deliberately building stuff more shitty so that they can make extra money in the repair and don't want us doing our own repairs, thus cutting them out of the repair money? I think this is a really important part of the story, right? Companies make money off of this in two ways. One is, Roy, exactly what you said. They want to, com they want to control the repair market for themselves. John Deere knows somebody's going to repair a million dollar tractor, but they want that money flowing to them. The other piece of it is companies don't want things to be repaired at all, right? Regardless of who does it, because they actually don't want it they don't want to make money off of the repair. They want to make money off of the sale of a new product. Right? We're talking to you, so, printer industry. Fucking, I the, would yeah. name the brand, but I don't want to get sued. Y'all, <laughs> these shitty ass printers, and then you make me buy another one. You, I'm sorry, keep going. Keep right, going. right. So, you know, printers are a good example. Phones are a good example, right? Apple keeps its shareholders happy, keeps its stock prices high, keeps its quarterly earnings high by selling about 200 million iPhones a year. Everybody's already got a phone. So who's buying 200 million new phones? It's people that are replacing their, their old phones, right? So we've gotten so good at mass production 
um, and this has been true really since you know after World War II, we're so good at mass production that we have to find ways uh, to create demand for all of these products, right? And one way to do that is to make sure that it's difficult or expensive or inconvenient to repair them. And we've seen that idea of planned obsolescence really emerge in kind of the second half of the 20th century. But companies know, I mean, Tim Cook, right, CEO of Apple has said publicly that when repair for phones is inexpensive and easy, they sell fewer products. So I think that's the economic rationale. As pro repair as I am, and people like will look at stuff that's made 70 or 90 years ago and say, look, this thing has lasted this long. I think there is a bias in that all the crappy items from 70 years ago are long dead. So you don't see them. So you don't know that they haven't lasted. And as consumers, I think if you had two devices in a store, if you had a $1,500 appliance and it said 50 year warranty, and you had a $200 appliance and it's like, I think most people would still go for the $200 appliance. So there is a small portion of it being uh, people as consumers, this will decide, listen, that's a quarter of the price. I'm going to buy that because the people that are making the much more expensive stuff, they don't necessarily advertise, by the way, this will still work in 50 years. Now there is the flip side of it, which are the things that companies do to go out of their way to make repair hard. So for instance, you take a charging chip in a MacBook. Let's say this is a very common repair we do that Apple will bill 700 to $1,500 for. And it requires a $5 chip that goes bad from either Texas Instruments or Intersil. If you Google ISL 9240 Facebook, the first result is somebody asking Intersil, hi, can we buy this chip? And them saying, no, we're not allowed to sell it to you. That's an official company representative saying that. Mm -hmm. Stuff like that is stuff that's kind of like done on purpose, in my opinion, to make repairs more difficult. But as time goes on, I would imagine when it comes to profitability, it's not just the immediate connection of, man, if you're able to fix your own stuff, you won't buy a new one. I think it's in order to make repair viable, we need to have an entire supply chain set up to make repair viable. And that costs money. So screw that. You know, if you read these books, um, the just-in-time manufacturing and then like the, the Toyota way of manufacturing and things like that, when companies may take that and kind of pervert it and dilute it to the extreme, making just enough parts to manufacture what we think we're going to sell versus having spare parts left over for a repair network is far more profitable. So it may not even be, I don't want you to fix it. I want you to buy a new one. It may also be, have, you know, just considering repair at all within the supply chain will cost us a lot more money. So it's not that we don't want you to fix it. It's just, eh, it's just an afterthought kind of thing. After the break, I want to talk a little bit about who suffers the most uh, under this weird archaic system. I'm going to check with legal real quick during the break as well and see if I can shout out this printer company that's full of shit. It's so, oh my God. The show, they're so full of shit. And we're going to talk about how the corporations are fighting back against people like you two. It's beyond the scenes. We'll be right back. Fuck that printer company. Beyond the scenes, we are back. And legal has told me that I cannot name that particular printer company that always sells me a printer. And after two years, it breaks in the cost of the repairs right neck and neck with the cost of a new printer. Fuck you, Hewlett Packard. Look, we're talking about the right to repair. Now, we talked about what it is and kind of why companies do that. But beyond the computer user, beyond the cell phone user, even me with the CPAP, can you can we talk a little bit about the real life implications and how this affects regular everyday Americans when companies aren't allowed to make repairs or companies can't afford to make the repairs on equipment that saves lives or supports full industries. Uh, talk to me a little bit about the ripple effect of that, Aaron, and how that trickles down to the average American. It just takes money out of people's pockets, right? Repairs are more expensive. We end up buying more new stuff than we need. Uh, and that costs American families. I mean, this is hard to pin down an exact dollar figure for, but I think comfortably, confidently we can say tens of billions of dollars right collectively that we are uh that we are spending that we otherwise wouldn't have to spend that's important it's not the only important thing right so one thing that i think the pandemic really helped to highlight is the ways in which we really depend on functioning markets for repairs and replacement parts, right? So we had issues where, you know, during the early part of the pandemic, when hospitalizations, you know, were, were really high, we saw respirators breaking down and the companies who make them, who insist 
that they're the only people qualified to fix them, weren't able to keep up. They didn't have enough technicians. They didn't have enough parts. And so hospitals had to find ways of doing this themselves or third party organizations came in and, and filled that gap. I think that's important to recognize like the, the, the value that independent repair gives us, right? We live in a world with these very complicated international supply chains, but they're kind of brittle, right? If the wrong thing happens, things start to fall apart and somebody needs to be able to step in uh, and, and fix those problems. And, and one of the things I really worry about when we live in a world where the manufacturer is the only person that's authorized to make repairs is that we don't develop the sorts of skills that people need you know, to, to interact with this technology. I mean, I'm sure Lewis can speak to this, but repair is a practice that builds up a whole bunch of really valuable skills, analytical thinking, problem solving, right? Thinking through a complicated problem. And it helps us to actually understand the way these devices work. And I think that's just important so that we're not dependent on these companies so that we can use the technology, but still be kind of free, independent actors in the world. And I think we're losing some of that. Yeah, I think one of the interesting things here is, you know, one of the biggest things that I think you lose in general is just when you think about the philosophical shift in our culture, the people like Steve Wozniak that are responsible for us having an Apple at all. If he lived in a world where you were not supposed to open up anything and you're not allowed to tinker with any of your own stuff, he could be a middle manager at Foot Locker right now, for all we know. I mean, what drives people to get into this, what drives people to decide, I'm going to get a degree in electronics or engineering, or I'm not going to get in a degree, but I'm just going to start making stuff on my own, is the fact that they're able to open things up, they're encouraged to open things up and work on them. And this idea that you can't do that because of safety and security, which are all nonsensical lies so that a company can avoid saying, we just want to make more money, is a really negative shift in the culture. And the idea that what you buy isn't yours, you don't own it, you have no control over it, you're just using it long enough to buy another one. This idea that you're shifting control away from you to the company, it's just, it's a philosophical shift that I don't think is going to be healthy for property rights going into the next generation. And that's aside from all the money that consumers are going to lose when they're not able to fix something that has a basic problem. Lewis, how much did you consider the fight that you're fighting with the right to repair, how much did you consider that what you were doing would also be good for the environment? Like the environmental toll of the throwaway culture, you know, of people always having to constantly replace devices instead of fixing them. You know, did, did you ever think about the environmental aspect of it? Did you, did you come into this as an environmentalist or did you even think of that? Or was it just like, hey, fuck them, that's not fair. And then also, ooh, it's good for earth. I honestly never thought about the environment while I was doing this for a number of reasons. Like when I, the thing that first got me excited about repair, if I'm being honest, was I was able to save five or 600 bucks at a time when I was broke, which is really cool. The other thing that gets me excited about this is, you know, when somebody says, I have all of my wedding photos on here and they're crying because they have no backup and they give me a hug when I can get their stuff back as a result of, you know, fixing a drive that's clicking or some, or fixing a board that's dead. That makes me happy. Seeing other people go from working the, you know, minimum wage at Walmart to making a living for their family. That's what, that's the stuff that gets me excited for the environment. I could talk about it till I'm blue in the face, but just being honest and having met with so many legislators over the past eight years, nobody cares whether i'm talking to you know a republican in an oil rich district or i'm talking to a very progressive person in an area where they they claim they care about the environment it's it's the thing that people care about the least whether it's myself or like even just the people that I'm, I'm talking to that claim they care about it that have legislative positions what they usually care about is uh, you know is this going to get me in trouble will this create jobs in my district will this get people to vote for me and the uh, i always try to focus on the things that people are personally invested in because as a species we're really good at caring about things that affect us right now and we really don't care about stuff that's going to be a problem tomorrow so if i can tell somebody here's how you save 900 dollars, here's how you get your baby pictures back Here's how you go from making $9 an hour to making $40 an hour. I can get people on board. If I tell people this is good for the environment, like they'll say they <laughs> care, but like they'll say they care, walk away and, you know, do something else. Yeah. I just, I can't rely on that being the thing that excites people about this as a movement, but it, but it is technically true. I mean, if you're throwing something away versus recycling it or repairing it, there's a lot more waste involved there. Like if I'm throwing away, if I'm even if, even if we were not recycling at all, if I'm throwing away 20% of the device instead of a hundred percent of it, that's still better for the environment. See, I mean, I think Lewis is right that, um, you know, these environmental arguments I think are really important 
but the environmental harms are very diffuse, right? They're not concentrated in the way that like money out of your pocket is concentrated. And they're often like really distant. The people who suffer the most uh, from these environmental consequences aren't, you know, wealthy people in the United States, right? They're poor people around the world. Um, but I've started to take this kind of perverse pleasure in bumming people out about buying new stuff by talking about the environmental consequences, <laughs> right? So normally we focus on the kind of e-waste side of this, and that's a huge problem. You know, we create something like 50 million metric tons of electronic waste every year from consumer electronics. That number keeps going up. You know, electronic waste that's full of all sorts of like really toxic shit, that arsenic and lead and mercury Battery that's going juice. into the soil that's going into the water, that causes all kinds of health problems. Doesn't, doesn't typically affect those of us in the United States all that much, because for a long time we shipped all of our electronic waste uh, to China or to Vietnam or to you know, some other country to let them deal with it. So that's one half of the problem. The other half of the problem is on the front end in terms of the production of, of these products. Um, you know, raw materials, right, are being removed from the earth to make all of these these products. So, you know, we got cars, we got appliances, but like we make one and a half billion phones a year globally, right? Um, a smartphone contains something like 75 out of the 83 known stable elements in the universe. Uh, these are, you know, complicated things. It's not just like copper and gold, but there's a bunch of rare earth metals in there. Extracting all those materials starts basically with like blowing a bunch of shit up. Uh, and then you use a bunch of toxic chemicals to separate the metals from the ore. And then that creates like millions of gallons of toxic slurry that gets stored somewhere and eventually causes a bunch of environmental damage as, as well, right? Um, on the other hand, I hear the iPhone comes in yellow now. Uh, so, you know, it's a it's a trade off. What cases are companies making against the right to repair? Like, why are they so resistant to this? The arguments that companies make against the right to repair, you know, they'll talk about, you know, security and privacy and how important it is uh, to protect those consumer interests. And of course, I agree, like I'm not against security. I'm not against privacy. Uh, but if everyday regular repairs um, open your device up to a security vulnerability, then your device is poorly designed, right? You're just kind of telling on yourself there if the idea that fixing the thing opens you up to some security uh, risk. When it comes to privacy, I'll be honest with you, I'd trust somebody like Lewis to take better care of my data than I would the nameless authorized service provider at the local Best Buy that Apple has a deal with, right? Um, somebody who runs their own business, who is accountable, who has like a real commitment to you know customer service, I think that's important. Apple actually had to settle a lawsuit within the last uh, year or so for millions of dollars when one of its own technicians stole and shared nude photos of an Apple customer, right? So they're not like the, the you know, the perfect example here of, of, mm -hmm. of security and privacy. They talk about safety, right? And, and it's, you know, uh, independent repair or self-repair is dangerous that we're going to like blow ourselves up swapping out the batteries on our phones. Um, you know, people have been fixing their own cars in this country since there have been cars in this country. Anybody who wants to swap out the brakes on their 5,000, 6,000 pound hunk of metal that they drive around at 85 miles an hour is free to do so. I think we'll be okay if some people uh, give, a, a give you know, swapping out their phone screen at home a try. Lewis, to, to all of everything that Aaron just said, have you ever seen anything proprietary when you cracked open the inside to some of these devices? Like, have you ever felt like, oh, wow, this is probably something I shouldn't have seen in the company. If I was evil competitor B, I would make something very similar. To, like like the same reason why the government tries to blow up drones when they crash in enemy territory so you can't get our fucking schematics and all of that. Are companies justified in being against right to repair on the grounds of trying to protect their trade secrets? 
I don't think so because if you, the entire argument is that we'd have competition that makes that, that just copies our design and steals everything. So if you take a look at what I do, the schematics are available. I mean, again, I, it's not available through the channels I'd like, but if I'm able to get a schematic for five or ten dollars on some random non-English website on the internet, then surely Toshiba or Acer or somebody else can. So why haven't Toshiba and Acer and everybody else created a complete clone of the MacBook? It, the, the reason is because the documentation we're requesting and the information we're requesting is not enough that you can create a carbon copy of this computer. It would be like if I took a picture of you and then I said, okay, from this picture, I can clone you. Like you can't clone somebody from a picture the same way that I can't clone a device from a, schem a bare bones schematic that says this resistor is attached to this capacitor at this value. There, there's a lot of information that's necessary for manufacturing that we are not requesting access to. So if you were able to do this, then Realistically speaking, somebody would have cloned the iPhone using what they have in ZXW tool, or they would have cloned a MacBook from the, you know, the three megabytes of schematics and PDFs that I share when I do a repair video. And that's just not happening because we're only requesting the bare bones minimum necessary to actually do our job. Well, after the break, we'll bring it home by talking about what progress has been made. We talked about the beginning of the right to repair movement, uh, but I would love to know where you all now with this issue, where some of the companies are now with this issue, and what can regular people like me do to be a part of the solution other than leaving hateful tweets at the Hewlett Packard Corporation for their shitty printers. This is Beyond the Scenes. We'll be right back. Beyond the scenes, round and third, headed for home. The right to repair. Before we get into what legal progress has been made and what changes the two of you would like to see, Lewis, is there anybody on the inside of these companies that have spoken to you like off the record about what you're doing? How much do the people who work for these companies believe in the policies that these companies have in place? A lot of them don't, and one of them, I'm not going to say the company because I don't want to out them, but a Hewlett company- Hewlett Packard. It was Hewlett Packard. <laughs> there's, there's somebody who worked at a company that I've that I've talked about quite a bit on my channel, and he said, you know, he was just upfront and honest and said, I've made a lot of money working for a company that I vastly disagree with. So when I started my fundraiser for lobbying in all these states, he wired $100,000 over without me even asking what he was going to do after I gave him the bank account details. So there's a lot of people that work within wow. these companies that don't agree with their policies, and some of them have said, you know, I started actually getting in. The, the really cool thing, once, and this is how you start to feel old, is like once somebody says, I started watching your stuff in 2016, I graduated in 2021, and I got my engineering job in 2022. So now I work at the company that you that you were essentially <laughs> bad about <laughs> before, I even before I even started my career. So yeah, like the, there are a lot of people inside these companies that don't agree with these policies that just don't necessarily have the power themselves to actually work towards changing them. What progress has been made on the legislative side? And, you know, what changes do the two of you think would be most impactful just in the short term, you know, on this issue? Just to give a little bit of the, the backstory here, all the way back in 2012, the state of Massachusetts passed a right to repair law that applied to automobiles. And it required car makers to make repair parts and tools and software and information available to car owners and to independent repair shops on reasonable terms. That model worked really well. It was adopted by all the car companies at the time as essentially a nationwide standard. Uh, and it's proven effective in, in most respects. Um, it also formed the basis for the bills that have been introduced over the past few years in 30 plus states uh, around the country. And those bills have broad bipartisan support among consumers, among voters, right? This is like a 70 to 80% issue. One of the few things that people really agree on uh, across that sort of partisan divide. But we've seen really powerful companies spend a lot of money uh, on lobbyists to block those bills, to water those bills down. Um, you know, we've seen some success. So there are bills progressing through state houses in a bunch of states right now. Last year, Colorado uh, passed a right to repair law focusing on motorized wheelchairs because there was a really specific and egregious problem going on for, for folks that use motorized wheelchairs. It's a great law, but it doesn't go far enough. Um, New York uh, passed a bill as well that was 
overwhelmingly supported in both houses of the legislature there. Uh, but as, as Lewis will probably want to talk to you about in some more detail, was really watered down by, uh, by the governor in New York. And I'm, I'm, I imagine Lewis has some, some thoughts on that. Yeah, yeah. So in, in the state of New York, uh, there was a bill that we've worked eight years on. And in the last uh, week, the governor allowed the opposition lobbyists to rewrite the bill. So the edits that were suggested by the opposition were directly written into the bill. So Kathy Holchel allowed uh, Apple, Samsung, and everybody else to literally write the, the legislation that they would be regulating them. Yes, I will write the law to make sure that I follow the laws. Where's the ink pen? Thank you. And what about Massachusetts in 2014? Talk to me a little bit about that and how they codified that law. Yeah, so, you know, Massachusetts did this, um, you know, in a couple of ways, actually, simultaneously. So there was a ballot initiative that the voters actually got to vote on, and it won by like 80% of the vote, right? And I think that is a really important signal here. If this issue is decided by voters, the right to repair wins. It's not even close. Right. It's um, just as we talked about in New, in New York, it's when you get these closed door meetings, either with the governor or with state legislators, where, you know, either the bills don't happen at all or they get really watered down and and limited. Right. So I think that's something we've got to be worried about. Uh, it's a tough fight because it's happening simultaneously in a bunch of states all at once. I would prefer to see this issue fixed on a national level, a federal level, rather than by uh, kind of state to state rules. Mm -hmm. um, there have been some important bills that, that have been introduced in the U.S. Congress um, addressing auto repair, addressing consumer electronics, addressing agricultural equipment. Those are good bills. Uh, but Congress is just like a dysfunctional mess, right? So getting anything past there, even though the American public is broadly supportive, I think is a tricky thing to do. There are other avenues. There's the executive branch. Um, the Federal Trade Commission under Lena Khan's leadership has taken a real interest in repair. They've taken a pretty aggressive stance. They issued a really important report that shot down a lot of the manufacturers' arguments uh, a couple years ago. They've been taking enforcement actions uh, on repair restrictions against companies like Harley Davidson. Um, but they can do more. They could adopt rules that make it clear that some of these practices we've been talking about should be treated uh, as unfair and deceptive, um, you know, commercial practices. The most interesting part with the Massachusetts one is it was voted in favor of 74 to 26 by residents. And the manufacturers commercials from General Motors, Toyota, Ford, Nissan, and Honda were saying that if this passes, if mechanics can fix your car, they're going to stalk you through parking lots. They're going to break into your house. They're going to rape you. This bill supports racism, redlining, sexual assault. Like what? they threw the kid. Yeah. And I, I archived their website and I archived their advertising because this was all taken offline the moment they lost. But they, they had these scary commercials where there'd be somebody walking behind you and the light would be very, very blue. And as they got closer to you, you'd hear, you know, you'd hear pop and then you <laughs> just you hear like... Wrench. If question one passes in Massachusetts, anyone could access the most personal data stored in your vehicle. Domestic violence advocates say a sexual predator could use the data to stalk their victims, pinpoint exactly where you are, whether you are alone, even take control of your vehicle. Vote no on one. Keep your data safe. They threw all of this at just the ability of a mechanic to be able to fix your car. And they spent $25 million on all those advertisements and they still lost. So it must have been worth something to them. So then to that point then, Aaron, talk to me a little bit about these companies that are trying to get ahead of the PR nightmare that this would be for them by being proactive before there's legislation. Like with John Deere, I find this in interesting. Like break down what John Deere is doing and then I want the two of you to tell me whether or not this is legitimate steps towards change or as Garfield the cat would say, insincere sincerity. 
Yeah, it's a really it's a really important point. John Deere and other agricultural firms have signed uh, what they're calling a memorandum of understanding with the American Farm Bureau Association, which basically, you know, they've tried to tell this story that this is their effort to solve this problem and to give farmers access to all the things that they need to engage in repair. And I got to be honest with you, I've read these documents. They are not worth the paper they're written on. They don't do anything. They are completely voluntary. John Deere can back out of this agreement anytime it wants to. It basically obligates the company (laughs) to do nothing that they don't already say they're doing. So they say, we will make software available to farmers. But the Memorandum of Understanding defines software, and it defines it really specifically as one particular program, um, the John Deere Customer Advisor Program, which they tell us is already available to farmers, right? So if it's already available, what are farmers getting from this deal? The other thing is, even if you get access to that software, it doesn't do what you need it to do. It's not the program that can actually initialize or authorize these parts after a repair has been done. So it's just about PR from my perspective. I don't think it moves the needle one bit But when they made that announcement and sent out their press release, there were a bunch of news stories that were saying, oh, look at this, John Deere is so responsible. So I think the media fell for it in a lot of instances when they they really shouldn't have. I think you have to separate the companies that are doing it genuinely from the companies that are not. So like if you have a company like Framework, they release their laptop, every single part that to, to that laptop is available on their website. If you want schematics, you do have to contact them. There's no download link, but if you contact them, they will actually give you the schematic to the device. So they are following through on their promise to be more a repair friendly company that was started as a repair friendly company. It, with mm-hmm. Apple, they created an independent repair provider program, but that program requires that they can audit me at any time. If I have parts that I'm not supposed to have in my facility, they can kick me out of the program and get me in legal trouble, which I do. I have schematics. I have chips that I'm not supposed to have. They still restrict you from buying all these different chips. They don't make the LCD by itself available. You can't buy a keyboard by itself. You can't buy a schematic. You can't buy a board view. The program, when it first came out, didn't even allow you to actually stock parts. You would have to take all your customers' information, take their IMEI number, send all the stuff back to Apple, and then buy a part because you weren't allowed to stock it. So there are some companies that have come out with programs that, in my opinion, are complete garbage, and they're just designed to show a regulator, look, you don't, we don't, you don't need to, uh, you know, you don't need to sign a bill. We're doing it all mm. ourselves. When in reality, that program provides us with nothing. And then there are companies like Framework or Fairphone, where they are in good faith, actually making parts available, schematics available, and everything that somebody like me would need to be able to work in a customer's product. And yeah, you know, what Aaron said is very important, which is the moment that news came out from John Deere, you had like 20 or 30 news articles saying, John Deere gives farmers what they want. So I just decided... Again, I grew up in Brooklyn. I'm not. I, I'm not a farmer. I can barely, you know, grow a Venus flytrap. I just called up a farmer that I knew and I said, "Hey, does this actually get you what you want?" And I had a 10 minute conversation with him where he very politely went through why this doesn't give him anything. And I was wondering, you know, gee, why didn't the BBC do that? Why didn't any of these news companies do that? Why Why mm-hmm. didn't they just call a farmer and ask? And that's what happened when Apple came out with their self repair program too. You know, all these tech companies, all these news organizations that cover tech companies, I should say, started saying. Look, Apple is now repair friendly. Apple supports right to repair. And it's like, no, they don't. I still can't buy anything I need to actually fix anything. But it it allows, you know, them to take advantage of lazy bloggers and journalists that don't call people involved in the field and get good PR for themselves. The same thing happened when Governor Holtrell signed this bill. You had all these people saying right to repair wins in New York. And I'm like, the F it does. This bill says that if they if the company says they don't want to sell you an assembly, they don't have to sell you an assembly. This is useless. What can people do to get involved in the right to repair movement? And how can consumers be more mindful about the products they purchase? I think that the best thing that anybody can do is if they are somewhat good at repair in any way, shape or form, get other people to be excited. I want people to be personally invested. I don't want them to feel a shame because they're buying something new. I want them to feel a sense of excitement and happiness because they just saved a thousand dollars or excitement and happiness because they just made five hundred dollars this week off of a side gig that they otherwise wouldn't have made if you can get somebody to be personally invested in caring about this because you've helped them recover data you've helped them make something work again you've helped them avoid downtime let them know at the end of it by the way this 
we may live in a world two years from now where this is not possible, and here's why. It's like at the end of the movie, 25th Hour with Ed Norton. He tells all of his kids after he escapes from uh, him, after he escapes from having to go to jail. I, I probably shouldn't have spoiled the best Ed Norton it's movie in existence, but I did. Yeah. But yeah, he, he's, neck he's, and he neck said, with American history X. But continue. We'll debate offline. Yeah. But yeah, but but he's you know, but he says this is how, he tells the origin story to his kids, and he says this is how close you all were to never happening. And one of the things I try to do with every one of my customers is I tell them this is how close I was to not recover covering any of your wedding photos or any of your baby photos. This is how close you were to paying $2,000 instead of $200 for a repair. Get as many people personally invested as possible. And when it comes to the personal decisions people make on what they buy, that's a difficult one. Like I, this was something where 20 or 30 or 40 years ago, I think you could have chosen this company for being repair friendly versus this one. But now you really, in many industries, you really are just choosing between like the le uh, 20 companies that are not going to make a schematic available, that are not going to make a part available. So it's really hard to recommend one company over the other. And you do have scrappy startups like Framework and Fairphone that are trying to produce products that are repair friendly. But many of these companies, admittedly, and while I do love what they're trying to do, they have limited funding. So, you know, you're getting a device that's last generation and they have a one size fits all product. So it, it's really, it's not one of those things where it's easy to just pick the repair friendly solution now as it would have been, let's say 30 or 40 years ago, because in many cases there aren't any. Beautiful. Aaron, uh, real quick, how can people get involved? At first, I'm con contractually obligated to, to uh, you know, try to sell my book. Uh, so people should read The Right to Repair from the fine folks at Cambridge University Press, um, where I try to talk about uh, a lot of the things that we've been covering today. Um, but I think we should, you know, look at the resources that are out there and available to people. We should look at sites like iFixit, which provides repairability scores and repair instructions for tons of products. Um, you know, we should support the work that Lewis is doing. We should be supporting the work uh, that Nathan Proctor and the folks at US Perg have been doing around repair. But I think most importantly, we've got to be kind of reflective a little bit about our own choices and our own behavior, right? The phone in your pocket did not materialize out of thin air. Um, there was lots of labor, lots of resources, and lots of costs uh, built into that device. And I think we have an interest in making it last uh, as long as it can, right? So I'm not saying we all have to like read by candlelight and never use TikTok again. But I think we have to make these products last longer and repair is really essential to that goal. And I think once people start to internalize that story and understand the way companies are trying to sort of manipulate their behavior, it becomes a lot easier to at least have some awareness of this issue. And then the behavioral change, I think, flows from there. Well, this has been a wonderful, wonderful topic. I cannot thank you both for all of this wonderful information. And fuck you, Hewlett Packard. Make a better printer, you mother. I cursed a lot this That's episode. an opinion, actually. So I think legal would be okay with that. That's your oh, opinion. You're asking you. them to be better. You're actually being a motivational speaker. We'll see. Our legal department is very litigious. I can't say anything mean about anybody. <laughs> That's all the time we have for today. Aaron, Lewis, thank you so much for going beyond the scenes with me. 